Hello everyone, Mr. Linder here. Let's talk about some interesting physiology related to the cell cycle. So the cell cycle is really just the life cycle uh, of a cell. The phases of the cell cycle include the G1 phase, the S phase, the G2 phase, which we actually collectively refer to as interphase. Um, and oftentimes people assume that the cell is at rest during interphase, uh, but actually during interphase, there are lots of things taking place, uh, especially preparation for cell division. So cells that can divide uh, will move through the various stages uh, of interphase before entering what's called the M phase, uh, which is the mitotic phase of the cell. Uh, in G1, uh, you'll see growth uh, and development uh, taking place, uh, oftentimes uh, production uh, of messenger RNA and proteins, uh, various organelles, um, and really just preparation uh, as you move into uh, the S phase. Uh, the S phase is actually really important because this is where DNA replication uh, takes place. Uh, if you're going to have mitosis and create uh, two nuclei and eventually uh, two new cells, you need to make a copy of the genetic information uh, so that you can pass it on uh, to the next cell. Uh, the G2 phase uh, is really preparation for cell division, so you'll see a lot of protein production uh, and synthesis uh, for enzymes uh, and protein signals uh, that are necessary for the uh, mitotic phase. Uh, the M phase then, of course, is where mitosis takes place. Uh, the stages of mitosis are prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Now, mitosis is actually uh, the division of the nucleus. So as you go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, uh, what you're actually doing is you are uh, dividing up the genetic material uh, within the cell. Uh, you can see that uh, by centrioles moving to opposite sides of the cell, the mitotic spindle forming uh, and interacting with the chromosomes. Uh, we have a, eventually a lining up of the chromosomes as we move move into these uh, later stages, metaphase, you see the lining up of the chromosomes, uh, and then we see the chromosomes being separated as the mitotic spindle uh, is being pulled in uh, opposite uh, sides of the cell, uh, and so we have separation of the chromosomes. Uh, and then you're going to see in uh, telophase or telophase uh, the formation of a new nucleus. And so we have what we refer to as mitosis, uh, the division of the nucleus. So we've created not one, but two nuclei, uh, each with uh, the 46 chromosomes uh, that should be in each human uh, cell. In order for you to have two cells, uh, you would also need to have what's called cytokinesis. Uh, cytokinesis is division of the cytoplasm. Uh, and that typically starts in late anaphase and then will continue on uh, through telophase. Uh, and then you'll have two cells uh, at the end of cytokinesis. So mitosis and cytokinesis are actually uh, separate mechanisms. Again, mitosis, division of the nucleus, cytokinesis, division of uh, the cytoplasm. To, but to prepare for all of that, uh, again, remember that you had this interphase that was taking place, that G1, S, and G2. So the cell is, is active uh, throughout interphase. Uh, it's performing its cellular functions. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, and then you're replicating the DNA in the S phase and you're really preparing for uh, mitosis in that G2 phase. Now, if a cell is not going to go through mitosis, uh, so if you're looking at a particular neuronal cell or if you're looking at, uh, say, cardiac muscle cells uh, that no longer go through uh, mitosis, then they would stay uh, in that, uh, you know, basically live out their life in that G1 phase uh, of the cell cycle. So what drives, though, uh, this process of the cell cycle? Uh, what drives... Uh, really mitosis is these proteins called cyclins. Uh, so cyclins are going to drive us through uh, the mitotic uh, phases and, and really the, the interphase as well. So G1, S, G2, uh, and then mitosis, uh, we're going to be driven by these cyclin proteins. So this diagram may look more complicated, uh, 
But if you notice, here's G1 uh, labeled, and then S phase, G2, and the M phase. So we're still looking at the cell cycle, but you'll notice all of these different proteins and, and different enzymes uh, that are uh, labeled on this particular uh, diagram. What you want to clue into are things like cyclins. So this is cyclin D uh, or D1. Uh, here's cyclin E, cyclin H, cyclin A. Uh, and notice that they're interacting with the CDK abbreviation. Uh, CDK stands for cyclin-dependent kinases. So what's driving us through the cell cycle uh, are these cyclin proteins and their ability to activate cyclin-dependent kinases. Now, you will also notice on this diagram, though, that there are other proteins and, and other mechanisms uh, that are depicted in the diagram. Uh, for example, you'll see some of these blocking lines. And so you'll notice that there's some uh, proteins like uh, P53, that's protein uh, 53, uh, P21, uh, another protein, uh, and they are associated with inhibition. And so we'll come back to that concept uh, a little bit later, uh, but there are mechanisms that are going to slow down uh, the cell uh, cycle uh, or shut the cell cycle off completely. Uh, you'll also notice that cyclins are interacting with a process over here called ubiquination. Uh, ubiquination is a physiological process uh, for breaking down uh, proteins within the cell. Uh, so there's a lot of... Uh, physiological functions depicted in this diagram. But again, we want to focus on cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases um, for this lesson. So what do cyclins do? Uh, in general, cyclins promote the phases of the cell cycle. That's why you see them in each phase. So we have cyclins represented in G1, we have cyclins in the S phase, we have cyclins represented in the G2, and we have cyclins represented in the mitotic phase. So they're promoting and helping to drive the different phases of the cell cycle. For example, in this G1 phase, where you have cyclin uh, D uh, interacting with CDK, cyclin-dependent kinases, uh, that's going to be the drive for protein production and moving us through uh, this G1 phase. So what do cyclin-dependent kinases do? If cyclins turn on cyclin-dependent kinases, what is the role of a kinase? Anytime you see the kinase family of enzymes, you want to think of adding energy to something. So kinases are phosphorylators. They're going to provide energy uh, in the form of phosphate, because that is the energy currency uh, in our cells. And they are going to provide the energy that's going to drive uh, these proteins to do work uh, within the various phases. So the cyclin proteins, the cyclin proteins are going to activate cyclin-dependent kinases, and notice there are phosphates associated with them, uh, and those cyclin-dependent kinases are going to transfer energy to other proteins within the cell uh, so that they can go on uh, to do work for that particular phase. So again, cyclins activate cyclin-dependent kinases, and they are going to provide energy to other proteins to do work throughout the various phases. And so that's why you see them in all the different phases. So we see it in uh, G1. Uh, down here in the S phase, we see cyclin interacting with cyclin-dependent kinases. And again, notice the phosphate so that we can transfer energy to other proteins. Here we have cyclin in the G2 interacting again with a CDK, a cyclin-dependent kinase. And again, it's a phosphorylator to add energy and so forth and so forth. Now, what's interesting, though, is that because cyclins drive the cell cycle, if you have overexpression of cyclin proteins, uh, these have been shown to actually lead to um, causing cancers. Uh, so, for example, um, cyclin D has been associated with uh, breast cancers and esophageal cancers because overexpression of a protein that's going to drive you through the cell cycle is going to cause cells to divide uncontrollably. Now, why is it that we uh, actually are susceptible to cancers? Uh, 
Um, it turns out that we have genes within our genome that can uh, mutate and change uh, based on uh, exposure to various stresses. Uh, so whether it's uh, toxins within the body, whether it's ultraviolet radiation, uh, there are things that can change our DNA. So mutations happen to our DNA. And there are some genes that are more susceptible to those mutations that lead then to cancer. Uh, we call these genes proto-oncogenes, uh, and it turns out we all have them. So proto-oncogenes uh, are basically genes that you have in your genome uh, that function in normal healthy cells, but can mutate and become what are called oncogenes. So we have proto-oncogenes that are normal functioning uh, genes within the genome, but when they mutate, they become oncogenic. And so an oncogene is some gene now that's contributing uh, to cancer. It's contributing to uncontrolled cell division. So why is it that proto-oncogenes uh, are susceptible to becoming oncogenic? Uh, well, usually it's because they are involved in some uh, way to regulate cell growth or cell division or uh, cell adhesion, uh, so the way cells interact with one another. And so mutations in these particular genes therefore are going to lead to cancers because cancers, of course, are these uncontrolled uh, cell divisions. And so the, the cancerous cells are, um, the, the oncogenic genes are basically those that were involved in cell growth and cell division and so forth. So how do we prevent cancers? If we all have uh, these proto-oncogenes that can mutate into oncogenic genes, there must be a way for the human body to slow this all down because uh, we don't all get cancer. Uh, or maybe we have a cancerous cell that's taken care of by the immune system uh, before we ever see the adverse effects of the cancer. So what's going on to slow down cancer? Well, we have what are called tumor suppressor genes. So just like we have proto-oncogenes that can become cancerous, we also have other genes, though, in our genome that are responsible for suppressing uh, cancers. And we call these tumor suppressor genes. Tumor suppressor genes uh, are basically going to inhibit cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. Uh, one example is the P53 gene. I showed that to you on a previous slide. Uh, P53 is actually a protein product of the tumor suppressor gene, P53. And so this protein uh, happens to be 53,000 um, in molecular weight. That's where the number comes from. Uh, and this particular gene is actually acting as a transcriptional factor. So what this particular uh, protein does is it binds to another gene within your genome and it helps to produce another protein. So P53 is a protein product. It's going to bind to your uh, P P21 gene and that P21 uh, product then goes on to inhibit cyclins and cyclin dependent uh, kinases. So it would look something like this. If you are taking a look at strands of DNA, and let's say you know, we're looking at uh, two pieces of DNA, you'll have a particular gene uh, on the DNA uh, that codes for the protein, so we'll make a protein here, that codes for the protein P53. And then that protein can bind to another section of DNA, and it acts as a transcriptional factor, so we'll label that TF. So that P53 comes along and it binds to uh, another location in your genome. And that's going to allow this section of genome, this gene, to be transcribed and eventually translated into another protein. And that's that P21 protein. And so what we have here is then this P21 protein okay, is able to act as an inhibitor for cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases, uh, so we're not progressing through the cell cycle. So that progression of the cell cycle is being blocked. If you block the cell cycle, then of course you're slowing down 
the, the cell division, that uncontrolled cell division, uh, which leads to what we refer to as cancer. So P53 is a transcriptional factor. Uh, it binds to P21. P21 then goes on uh, to block cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. So why would P53 become active in the first place? You know, why would you get activation of P53? Well, it has to do with stress. And, and we're not talking about the stress uh, of final examinations uh, or just everyday life. We're talking about stress on a cell. So radiation, toxic chemicals, some sort of cellular stress is going to activate these genes within our genome that's going to produce the P53s and ultimately the P21s that are going to slow down uh, any sort of tumor development. What would happen though if your P53 gene was not functioning? So let's go back to this idea that this gene right here in your DNA okay, produces the P53 protein. What if that particular gene doesn't work? Well, it turns out that that leads to cancer as well. So just like overactivity of cyclins can lead to cancer, underactivity of your tumor suppressor genes can lead to cancer as well. So for example, skin cancers, oftentimes squamous and basal cell carcinomas, uh, have been shown uh, when P53 genes uh, are not functional. And, and the way you study uh, a lot of these genes is by using what are called knockout mice. Uh, and so researchers will uh, use uh, animal models uh, and they will actually shut off particular genes within that animal's genome so that they can actually uh, do research uh, on uh, cancer prevention. So a knockout uh, mouse has had a gene turned off uh, so that uh, the mouse will produce let's say tumors, uh, and then researchers can use various uh, radiation treatments and drug treatments to see if they can shrink those tumors uh, and slow down the cancer development. Uh, and knockout mice are nothing new. Uh, you can actually have uh, knockout mice for uh, diabetes research. Uh, we just mentioned cancer research. Uh, neurological research and so forth. Uh, and so knockout mice have been very important in uh, humans determining uh, physiological mechanisms and then also looking at the physiology, the pharmacokinetics of uh, medications uh, for particular diseases. Another thing that's interesting uh, in the discussion of the cell cycle and cancers uh, is the idea of matrix metalloproteinases. Um, matrix metalloproteinases MMPs for short, um, are a family of enzymes uh, that are actually used to uh, digest extracellular matrix. Uh, so we naturally produce them in the human body. Uh, and so on this diagram, you see MMPs labeled in various locations. Here's MMP12, MMP7, MMP9. Uh, these are various types of matrix metalloproteinase enzymes uh, that are used by body cells to break down uh, extracellular matrix. Uh, the, the reason we produce these naturally is so that um, immune system cells, for example, uh, can get into uh, damaged body tissue locations uh, and begin to fight uh, pathogens. Uh, so we have this uh, process of migration, it's known as chemotaxis, where chemical signals are released. Um, and uh, we have this process where uh, macrophages are attracted to uh, pathogens, but in order to get through the various tissue spaces from the blood, through the extracellular matrix, uh, and where the path pathogens are actually located, they're going to have to digest that connective tissue matrix. So we use MMPs naturally to do that. However, cancerous cells have access to these MMPs. So when cancer cells use matrix metalloproteinases, it allows those cancer cells to metastasize. So if you had a cell that has become cancerous, proto-oncogenes have become oncogenic, um, and now you have a cancerous cell that is dividing uncontrollably and going through the cell cycle, and it has access to uh, MMPs to digest uh, the protein uh, matrix, then those cancerous cells uh, can 
um, let me go back here, those cancerous cells uh, can then start migrating through the tissues and eventually get into uh, the blood and spread throughout the body. And we call that metastasizing. So MMPs are of interest to us with cancer uh, because the use of MMPs leads to metastasizing of cancerous cells and spreading through the body. Also MMPs, I want to go back to this diagram now, also MMPs uh, have been seen in other uh, conditions as well. Uh, so diseases like emphysema, atherosclerosis, uh, whether it's periodontal diseases, uh, arthritic conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, what we see is MMP enzymes being used to break down body tissues uh, and lead to other types of diseases as well. So there is a family of drugs called MMPIs, matrix metalloproteinase inhibitors, uh, that are prescribed to patients uh, to slow down the activity of the MMP enzymes uh, and therefore treat a lot of different uh, biological conditions, a lot of different pathological conditions. Uh, the last thing I want to look at is the idea of apoptosis as we talk about the cell cycle and um, interesting things associated with it. And apoptosis uh, is really a form of cellular death. Um, cellular death, though, can be thought of pathologically, and then it can also be thought of as pre-programmed. Um, pathological tissue death is what we call necrosis. Uh, necrosis basically happens when you have physical trauma or toxins or uh, oxygen deprivation uh, that's going to cause cells to die, um, rupture, uh, and release digestive enzymes that are going to continue to uh, damage adjacent cells. Um, and really trigger inflammatory responses. So pathological tissue death uh, is not tidy, it's not controlled, it's just rupturing cells and releasing enzymes and causing uh, digestion of cells and therefore continued uh, cellular and tissue injury. Apoptosis, though, is programmed cellular death. It, it's really in its alternative patterns to get rid of cells uh, that have either lived their life expectancy uh, or they, they're starting to get older and worn down and we need to break down those cells and replace them. So think of apoptosis as programmed cellular death. It's not designed to disrupt neighboring cells. So you want the single cell to die without it affecting the cells nearby. So how do you do that? How do you get a situation where you can destroy a cell and not affect the cells around it? Well, it requires uh, cell signaling uh, that takes place. There are two pathways for this. So when we look at apoptosis, there is the intrinsic and the extrinsic uh, apoptotic pathways. So intrinsic and extrinsic apoptosis. Um, intrinsic, by its name, uh, is referring to the fact that we're going to focus on chemical signals that are happening inside of the cell. Extrinsic is talking about chemical signals from outside of the cell. So let's uh, take a look at these two pathways really quickly. So the extrinsic pathway is using uh, what's called a ligand. A uh, ligand uh, is a uh, term that we use to describe chemical signals. Uh, so this is a famous one. It's the FASL. Uh, this FASL, the L standing for ligand, uh, is a chemical signal that's going to bind to a receptor. So the FAS is the receptor. And notice that this is outside of the cell. So the cell that's going to die is this cell right here. Okay? This is the cell that's going through apoptosis. And so if it's an extrinsic pathway, we're using an external chemical Okay, the ligand, to bind to a receptor found in the membrane of the cell, and then that's going to trigger uh, a cellular response. The, the external uh, ligand is often referred to as the death ligand, uh, and the receptor is also referred to as the death receptor uh, because the cell is going to die. Uh, so the best example here is this uh, FASL binding to an FAS receptor. Uh, this is actually used in T lymphocyte uh, apoptosis. Uh, and what we see happening is the binding of the ligand to the receptor and the activation of what are called caspases. Uh, every time you see ACE, you think of an enzyme, and so caspases are enzymes 
uh, that lead to destruction of the cell. Okay? So caspases lead to the destruction uh, of the cell. So in the extrinsic pathway, we're just using an external signal to bind to a receptor to turn on caspases. In the intrinsic pathway, it also is activating uh, caspases, but it's occurring through internal signaling. So some sort of apoptotic stimulus uh, activates the mitochondria. So we actually work through the organelle, uh, the mitochondrion. And what's happening is there's a series of chemical signals uh, in the mitochondrion that's going to release cytochrome signals. So that's these guys right here. So the mitochondria is releasing cytochrome signals, and those cytochrome signals, again, then activate the caspase family of enzymes that lead to enzyme destruction. So in the intrinsic pathway, we use the mitochondrion, we release cytochrome signals, and then they eventually activate caspases. And so what are the caspases then? They're really the executioner enzymes. They're going to uh, cause fragmentation of the DNA uh, within the cell. Uh, they're going to break down uh, cellular membranes, uh, and that's going to lead to the overall death of the cell. So the main thing to remember, though, is that apoptosis is natural. It's programmed cellular death rather than necrosis. And we see this during embryonic development, uh, where there's tissue uh, processing that takes place. Uh, we see this in our digestive system when there's cellular turnover, um, apoptosis in our skin, apoptosis in our immune system cells, where we constantly need to have cellular turnover. So I hope you enjoyed some interesting things about the cell cycle uh, and uh, what drives the cell cycle, a little bit on cancer and apoptosis. Hope that helps. Take care.